Hello, today we're going to look at the double and single slit experiments and diffraction gratings. We'll start with the double slit experiment. Young's double slit experiment was supposed to be the definitive proof that light was a wave, not a corpuscle or a particle. Then along came Einstein and showed that light could behave both as a wave and as a particle. The principle of the double slit experiment is that if we take a piece of board with two slits in it and we have the ground underneath and over the two slits we put some dry sand then you would expect the sand to filter through the slits and to form a pile underneath the two slits. So these are piles of sand as the sand falls through. That's what you expect with sand do you get the same sort of thing with light? Well, let's just turn it round so that the slits are now like this. We're going to have a source of light, which we call a monochromatic source of light. Um, that means it's the same colour, red or green. You have to have it a single colour, otherwise you start to get um, the colours of the rainbow being filtered out and that upsets the experiment. So you want a single source of light so that the same light goes through both slits and comes onto a screen here. Now what do you expect? Well in the same way as the sand formed piles underneath the slits, you might expect that the light coming through here would form a, as it were, pile of light. So this is really a measure of intensity in this direction. So what we're seeing here is the brightness of the light on the screen. And similarly, opposite this slit here, you might again expect to find an intense light in this region, probably a bit dark in the middle, and then falling off to darkness on both sides. And that is certainly true. It's broadly true if what you do is to close off one of the slits. So if you close off one of the slits, you will actually get, broadly, that kind of impact. You'll get a bright area on the screen. But if you open up the second slit, and indeed if you close off the top slit, you will get the bottom effect. But if you open up both the slits, what do you actually get? Well, let's just draw this again. Here are the double slits. Here's the monochromatic single source of light, so the same light goes through both slits. There's the screen. And what you actually get opposite the sort of central point is you will get a bright area but then it falls off to a an area of darkness then an area of light then darkness then light then darkness then light and similarly on this side light dark light dark and these are fringes so on the screen what you're actually seeing is brightness dark bright dark bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, all the way down. Those are called fringes. In other words, you get darkness at a point where previously you got light. So how is it that if you get light with one slit and more light with a second slit, with both of them open, you actually get darkness where previously with only one slit you got light? How can that be? The answer lies in the nature of waves. It's called superposition. Imagine that you drop two stones into a pond, a still pond. And this is where the two stones fall into the pond. They will create ripples, which will, or waves, which will spread out across the pond. And it's the point where the ripples overlap that you get what's called interference. That means that you've got crests of one set of ripples meeting crests and troughs of another set of ripples. And what happens in those circumstances? A crest meets a crest. Here's a crest coming this way, meeting a crest from this set of ripples. They will in fact pass through one another and go out the other side. But when they overlap, you get what's called superposition. You get a double crest. Similarly, if you've got a trough from this stone meeting a trough from this stone, 
again you get superposition a double sized trough but if you get a crest from this set of ripples meeting a trough from this set of ripples you get flat water assuming that the amplitudes of the two are are the same so we have to get two identical stones and throw them in from the same height to get the same amplitude of waves they cancel out and it's that cancelling out that is the reason why you get dark fringes at all of these points here because the waves somehow manage to cancel each other out that's the principle of superposition on the other hand if the waves reinforce one another like this then you get a double crest or a double trough now what is actually happening when a wave goes through a slit you'll notice in the diagram i drew that i showed that the light seemed to spread out of it well let's take waves what we call plane waves coming from our source these are plane waves these are rather like the waves of the crest um, on the sea so if these lines each represent the crests then the wave looks something like this so that each of the lines there'd be another line here represents a crest of the wave and the distance between the lines is called the wavelength now what happens when plane waves meet a gap where the gap is broadly the same size as the wavelength what happens is that gap becomes what's called a Huygens source I've probably not pronounced that properly it's a Dutch name and you need to be able to get the right intonation but I'll call it a Huygens source after the man Huygens and essentially it becomes a separate source of waves and so you get waves spreading out in all directions rather like the ripples on the pool they'll have the same wavelength but that wave will move in this direction this wave down here will move in this direction so it's moving down there this one's moving up in that direction the wave spreads out in all directions that's called diffraction as the plane waves come to the slit the slit is broadly the same width or the same width as the wavelength then you get this diffraction effect and the light or the waves spread out by contrast if the slit is too large here is the slit here are the waves coming in this direction if the slit is too large the waves simply pass through they don't even realize that there's a slit there on the other hand if the slit is too small then the waves come along in this direction and they simply reflect and bounce back in the other direction they don't realize there's a slit to go through so if it's too small they reflect if it's too big they go through undaunted but if the slit is about the same size as the wavelength then you get this process called diffraction so what happens with the double slit experiment here's the double slit here are the waves coming along and what they're going to happen when they get to these slits they're each going to form a Huygens source so rather like the stones in the pond you're going to get two sets of ripples from these uh, two slits and where the waves overlap you're going to get interference where you've got double crests or double troughs you'll get constructive interference in other words you will get double sized crests and double sized troughs where you've got a crest meeting a trough you're going to get what's called destructive interference in other words the two will cancel out and you will get darkness I should explain that for light each of these slits has to be kind of nothing more than a small pinhole with the same gap between them so the distance between them is very very small and the holes themselves are very very tiny uh, in order that as I've said the pinholes have to be broadly the same wavelength as the wavelength of the light but in order to understand what's going on we need to magnify this significantly so let's assume that these are our two slits 
and they are a distance d apart. And although the waves are going to move off from these slits in all directions, I am for the moment going to consider a wave which moves off in that direction from the two slits, and that's going to be at an angle theta to, as it were, the horizontal. Now I drop a perpendicular down to this line here, and we know that this distance here is d. That's the gap, the thickness of the slit itself. And what I want to know is what is x, which is the distance from here to here? Well, if this is theta, then this angle here, by geometry, is also theta, which means that x over d is sine theta. x over d is sine theta, which means that x over d equals sine theta, x equals d sine theta. That's just pure geometry. But what happens if x is equal to lambda, i.e. the wavelength of the waves, or n lambda, where n is any whole number, integer. If that's the case, then the waves will be in phase, these two waves will be in phase, and you will get constructive interference. What I mean by that is that this wave will move in this direction like this, this wave will also do the same, but if this distance x is one complete wavelength, then you can see that from this point on, this wave is wholly in phase with this wave up here. The two are exactly in phase because this distance here was one complete wavelength or any number n, where n is a whole number, number of wavelengths so that you're going to get constructive interference because crest meets crest, trough meets trough. Your eye is up here looking at everything as it arrives. So that is the position for constructive interference. Crest meets crest to produce a double crest. Trough meets trough to produce a double trough. That's the position of, uh, of constructive interference. So if x is d sine theta, but x equals lambda or n lambda, then the condition for constructive interference is that n lambda, which is x, is equal to d sine theta from this formula up here. And that is the condition for bright fringes. And I think you can see that if x is equal to lambda over two, in other words, half a wavelength, or 2n minus 1 times lambda over 2, which means an odd number, an odd number of half wavelengths, because obviously an even number of half wavelengths is a number of whole wavelengths, so an odd number of half wavelengths or just one half a wavelength, then this distance here would only be half a wavelength, and consequently these waves would actually be completely out of phase. So that would be the condition whereby a crest would meet a trough to produce nothing. So that's the condition for destructive interference. In other words, 2n minus 1 times lambda over 2, which is this condition here, is equal to d sine theta. And that's the condition for dark fringes. This is light fringes because x is a complete number of wavelengths. This is condition for dark fringes, destructive interference, because x is an odd number of half wavelengths. So let's now imagine that we have our two slits. Remember these are essentially very small pinholes separated by less than a millimetre, but I'm drawing them much larger so that you can see what's going on. And we have a screen over here, and the screen is going to have interference patterns. This is, we are drawing intensity, in other words, in this way that shows the brightness on the screen. The brightness falls off as you get further and further out. The fringes go uh, reducing brightness, but, they're up, but they are still very visibly bright, dark, bright, dark fringes. <coughs> 
And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the first fringe, the first area of brightness. There will always be one bright fringe opposite the double slits, but we're going to look at the first fringe above the central fringe. And that's going to be at an angle theta. And we've already shown what the condition for a, fringe, a bright fringe is. It is that n lambda equals d sine theta. And obviously for the first fringe, n will equal 1. So here it's just lambda equals d sine theta. Let's suppose that the first fringe is a distance y above the center of the middle fringe. So we're measuring this in distance. And the distance from the slits to the screen is capital D. Then y over d is simply the tangent of the angle theta. And if it's a small angle, that is the same as the sine of the angle theta. Because if theta is very small, then this distance here is d and the horizontal, sorry, the hypotenuse is also, as far as it matters, also d. So for small angles, you can say that y over d is sine theta. And that means using this formula here that n lambda is equal to d times sine theta, which is y over d. So if you've got, uh, typically in an exam, you'd be given some of those values and you have to work out um, what the rest are. You'll notice incidentally that as n increases, n becomes 1, 2, 3 and so on. So y will progressively increase. So the next fringe will be twice y, the third fringe will be three times y, but only as long as theta is a small angle. As soon as theta becomes large, tan theta is no longer broadly equivalent to sine theta. And how many fringes will there be apart from the central fringe? This is fringe number one, two, three, four. How many fringes do you get? Well, the answer is that we know that n lambda equals d sine theta, which means that n lambda over d is equal to sine theta. And n is increasing in integer steps. And so you can keep going until n lambda over d would be greater than 1 because you can't have a sine theta greater than 1. So when as long as n lambda over d is less than 1 you can keep going and you will get as many fringes as you can have n lambda over d being less than 1. But the minute you get an n such that n lambda over d is greater than 1 that's a fringe you're not allowed to have. And the reason, of course, is that when sine theta equals 1, the angle theta will equal 90 degrees, which means this angle here is 90 degrees. If you attempt to go any further, even at 90 degrees, that light will never hit the screen. We now move on to the single slit experiment. So here is my single slit, and just like the ripples from the pond, uh, that is going to produce, it's a Huygens source, so you're going to get light diffracted through the slit and coming out in all directions. And it will be a pin, it will be a plane wave coming from a monochromatic source that comes up to the slit and then emerges in all directions. And on the screen, what you will find is that you will get a bright area of light right opposite the slit. It will fall to zero and then you will get small areas of light fringes um, on either side of the predominantly bright, this is a measure of intensity or brightness, on the screen. Now you might say there cannot be any interference here because we've only got one source, one Huygens source. It's like throwing one pebble into a pond there is nothing for the ripples to interfere with. So how can we get this admittedly small but nonetheless real interference pattern? Well, let's magnify the slit to see what's going on. This is the 
slit and the width of the slit is D. Now in the, in the double slit experiment, D was the distance between the slits. Very important to remember this. In the double slit experiment, D is the distance between the slits. In the single sit, uh, slit experiment, D is the thickness of the single slit. And once again, I'm going to consider, because of course light is going to emerge from here in all directions, but I'm going to consider the wave that emerges again at an angle of theta. And once again, I'm going to drop a perpendicular down here, and this distance we know is the thickness of the slit, which is D. But of course, light is emerging from all points in this slit. So let's take another light wave, which is coming up from the midpoint of the slit, and your eye is picking up all of these. Now then, this distance here, we're going to call x, just as we did before. And by geometry, once again, we can say that x is d times the sine of theta. And once again, we can draw in the wavelength up here. And we can ask ourselves, suppose x is a whole number of wavelengths. Let's, for the sake of this illustration, assume it's one wavelength. Then that would be one wavelength. And then the waves continue, and you can see that they are completely, or they should be if I've drawn it properly, they will then be in phase. So this wave and this wave are in phase. In phase, you might think you'll get constructive interference and brightness. But of course, if this is one wavelength here, then at this point, halfway up, it will only be half a wavelength. And so the remainder of the wave will proceed like that. Which means that this wave is out of phase with this wave. And this wave is out of phase with this wave. And if you think about it, at every point on the top half of the slit, there will be a corresponding point in the bottom half of the slit that will be exactly one half a wavelength out. So just as this one is completely out of phase with this because they are half a wavelength apart, so all the way down the top half of the slit there will be a corresponding point in the bottom half of the slit which will be exactly out of phase. Consequently the sum total of all the waves coming in the top half of the slit will cancel with the sum total of all the waves coming from the bottom half of the slit to give you darkness. So when x is d sine theta, for a double slit experiment, that's the condition for brightness. In the single slit experiment, this is the condition for darkness. This indeed is the condition for getting your first dark point when x is equal to lambda. So if x equals lambda, you get the formula lambda equals d sine theta, which is the condition for the first dark fringe. And you'll notice something else, that since the wavelength of the light is unchanged, as d decreases, theta must increase. So in other words, as you make the slit smaller, you will get a greater spread of the light, because theta which of course is the angle from the midpoint to the first dark fringe, that's the angle theta, the angle theta will get larger. So paradoxically, as you make the slit smaller, the light spreads out more. And once again, we can draw the position, here is the slit, here is the screen, Opposite the, the slit, you are going to get a bright area of light. This is, again, measure of intensity. And then some interference fringes. And we showed you why you get interference, because there is actually interference between the light that emerges from different points in the slit. And if we look at the first dark fringe, and we measure the distance theta, and we say that fringe is a distance y above the centre of the central fringe. And we say that the slit is a distance d, capital D, from the screen 
then for we know that y over d is the tangent of theta and once again for small angles it will also be the sine of theta and so consequently we've got this formula here lambda over d is sine theta lambda over d is sine theta but sine theta is y over capital D or if you like y is equal to lambda times capital D over small d so if you want to know how far up the screen y will be then if you know the wavelength you know the distance from the slit to the screen you divide that by the width of the slit you'll get um, the distance up the screen we now move to diffraction gratings and what are diffraction gratings well typically a diffraction grating this is pretty much kind of actual size about two to three centimeters square and don't ask me how they do it but engineers manage to draw lines on a diffraction grating um, and they can get typically something like 13,000 lines per inch uh, goodness knows how they do it but essentially what you've got are lines which are barriers to light and gaps or slits between the lines through which light can pass and the question is why is that better than a double slit what do you get with 13,000 slits that you don't get with a double slit well for illustration purposes I am going to take a diffraction grating which has four slits one two three four and just as we did before I'm going to take of course the light will come through plane waves will come along here from a monochromatic source and each of those slits will become a Huygens source each of them will diffract but I'm going to take light which emerges at this angle and you are watching it from up here and this angle of course just as we did before is the angle theta so all of those lines are at an angle theta to the horizontal the distance between the slits is a distance d as before so the distance between each slit is d and we can drop a perpendicular here that distance there is x and geometrically we can say x is d times sine theta and just as we did before we can say that if x is lambda then or n lambda then all these waves will be in phase so that is the condition for brightness n lambda equals d sine theta will mean that all the waves are exactly in phase and that's the condition for brightness just like the double slit experiment and that is what happens when x is a whole number of wavelengths but suppose it isn't here is my wave and if x is that distance there that's a whole wavelength and we know that that is a condition for brightness but suppose x is in fact only a fraction of the wavelength what happens then well x will always equal d sine theta because that's just pure geometry how many waves will there be in that distance x well x is the distance each wave has a length lambda and so the number of waves will equal the distance d sine theta divided by the wavelength of each wave which is lambda so that's the number of waves because x is the distance lambda is the length of each wave and if you divide up the length of each wave into the total distance x you get the number of waves which won't necessarily be a whole number now each wave we know is one cycle or two pi radians so if each wave is two pi radians then, and you've got d sine theta over lambda waves then the number of radians represented by this wave or the distance x of this wave will simply be the number of waves and since each wave is 2 pi radians 
it will be 2 pi times d sine theta over lambda because you multiply the number of waves by 2 pi because each wave is each complete wave is 2 pi and that we call since we're now talking about an angle that is now called delta and it is the phase angle so to give you an indication if this were one complete wave and x just happened to be that distance there, that would be one quarter of a wavelength. So it's one quarter of lambda. Or since one complete wave is two pi radians, this would be pi over two ra radians. So you can either express this as a distance or as a quarter of a wavelength or as pi over two radians. If delta is zero, or if delta is equal to any, mold, any integral number of two pi, that's constructive interference. Because what that means is that there is no uh, separation between one wave and another, they're completely in phase. Now, before we proceed, we better ask ourselves, what is light? Light is electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation does what it says on the tin. It's an electric field and a magnetic field. And the way it works is that you've got an electric field, which oscillates as a sine wave. And essentially what is happening is the electric field is simply like the water on the sea, bombing up and down. It's a traveling wave, so the whole wave is moving in that direction. And the, and the electric field vectors are simply oscillating up and down. But perpendicular to that electric field, there's also a magnetic field where the magnetic field oscillates backwards and forwards, exactly perpendicular to the E field. And you'll notice that the E field and the B field are completely in phase. The E field is at a maximum when the B field is at a maximum, and they're both zero at the same time. And the work of Maxwell established that the ratio of the E field to the B field is actually equal to C, the speed of light. So you can see that E is three times 10 to the eighth bigger than B. So the, I haven't drawn this to scale. The E field is very large. The corresponding B field is very small. We are going to consider, for the purposes of the diffraction rating, we're just going to be thinking about the E field. So here is my E field, that's the value of E, and the classic formula for a wave is E equals E naught times the sine of Kx minus omega t. I'm not going to go through what that means because we don't really need it here, save to say that if you look at my video on waves, you'll see how we derive that E naught is the maximum amplitude of the wave. But of course the wave is oscillating all the time. Now what happens if you get two um, waves coming from the same monochromatic source, this is the crucial reason why we have the same source, through two slits? Then you will get a wave coming through one slit and you will get a wave coming through another slit. And if the two are in phase, in other words, if we've got the condition for brightness, then these two will combine to, as it were, the superposition to get you a, a double crest and a double trough. And we can represent that vectorially. We can say, well, this is really the E field. So here's the E field for the first wave. We'll call that E. And added to that is the E field for the second wave, which will also be E because they both come from the same source. So they're both going to be exactly the same amplitude. And how do you do vectorial addition? Well, in this case, it's trivial because they are both in phase. So there's no angle between them. And consequently, the total E field will be 2E. So you get twice the electric field 
when the two waves are in phase. That is constructive interference. But if you have a diffraction grating with capital N slits, then I think you will see that the total electric field, when you get constructive interference, will not be 2E, but NE. In other words, the, uh, the size of the electric field, when all of those waves are in perfect alignment, will be N times the size of the individual electric field. But what happens if these two waves are out of phase by delta? There's the first, and here's the second. It doesn't start here, it starts here. So it is that distance, and that distance is delta out of phase. Now if we do vectorial addition, here is the E field for the first wave, but when we add it to the E field of the second wave, we must do so at an angle delta. Up here, the angle was zero, so it just becomes a straight line. But here, the vectorial addition of two E fields, they'll both be the same length. They don't look it, I better make it. They'll both be the same length E because they both come from the same source. But the vectorial addition, if you want to add vectors together, you always put the vectors tip to tail, and then you draw a line from the starting point of the first vector to the end point of the last vector, and that distance represents the value of the E field when the two are delta out of phase. So in other words, the total ET will equal E plus E, but you've got to recognize that you've now got an angle delta to take into account. Well, what happens if you've got four, my diffraction grating with four slits? And you've got the waves coming off such that each of them is an angle delta out of phase with the others. Well, then you'll have the first E field you can draw like this. The second E field, exactly the same length because it's the same source, because don't forget we've got a single source shining into these four slits. The second E field will be at an angle delta. The third E field will be at an angle delta. And the fourth E field will be at an angle delta. And to find the total E field, you have to do the vectorial sum of four E's. If you've got N, capital N, slits, then you're going to have N waves all delta out of phase. So you've got to do the vectorial sum of capital N uh, individual E fields. Before I do that generally, let's just look at the situation in some specific cases. Suppose delta equals pi over 2, or 90 degrees. So each wave is 90 degrees out of phase, or a quarter of a wavelength out of phase with the next one. Then your E diagram will look like this. There is your first wave. There's the second, which is 90 degrees out of phase. Here's the third, 90 degrees out of phase, and here's the fourth. I'm thinking of a four-slit diffraction grating. What is the length of the E vector? Well, it's the distance between the start of the first E vector and the end of the last E vector, and that's zero. So when the waves are pi over two apart, or 90 degrees apart, the E vector total will be zero, and that's the condition for destructive interference. You get a dark fringe. What happens if delta is equal to pi, which equals 180 degrees? Suppose all the waves are half a wavelength out of phase. There's the first one, there's the second one, there's the third one, there's the fourth one. Each of them, each successive one is 180 degrees out of phase. What is the distance between the start of the first E vector and the end of the last E vector answer, zero. This will also produce constructive interference, uh, sorry, destructive interference, darkness. But what happens if delta is equal to two pi? Well, in those circumstances, 
you're in phase because 2 pi is 360 degrees. It's one complete cycle. So if you've got four slits, you just add the four vectors up. Each of them is 2 pi um, separated from the other, which is the same as zero when it comes to uh, cycles. And so the total E field is equal to four times the individual E fields. Or if you've got N slits, capital N slits, the total E field will be NE. Now, it's worth noticing that the E field is not a measure of brightness. The brightness varies as N squared. So you don't get four times the brightness with four slits. You get 16 times the brightness that you would get from one individual slit. But I now want to address the question where delta is not one of these specific points. How do you generally calculate the total E field where you've got any value of delta? So how are we going to do uh, vectorial addition in order to find the resultant E field? The way we do it is we construct a circle. There's the circle. And this point is the center of the circle. And obviously the circle will have radius r, so that's r. And I'm going to do this for a four slit diffraction grating. We'll generalize it in a moment. And what I'm going to do is to mark off this distance between these two points here. I'm going to mark off such that there are four equal points. And these are straight lines I'm drawing now. They don't look it, but um, they are straight lines, four of them, and each of them will be my value of E, and each of them will be an angle delta separated from the previous one. So these are delta out of phase. Each one moves off at an angle delta. So here, this is the extension of the first one, and the angle between the two is delta. And if I draw radii to the beginning and end of each of the E fields, you can show geometrically that if each of these lines is an angle delta from the previous, then the internal angle here is also delta in each case. So the total angle is 4 delta. Or if I had capital N lines in my diffraction grating, this total angle would be capital N delta. You can also say that the angle, the external angle here, will be pi, which is 180 degrees, minus N delta. I hope we're all agreed on that. And what we're trying to find is the length, the vectorial sum of these four E vectors, which is this one here. You join the start of the first E vector with the end of the final E vector, and you have to do vectorial sum addition to find out what the total E field is. I'm going to do one more piece of geometry. I'm going to drop a perpendicular down here to the first E field. The length of this distance here is obviously going to be E over 2. We know that the radius is R, and we know that this is a right angle. So we can say that E over 2 divided by R is the sine of that angle, and that angle will be delta over 2 because we have effectively bisected it with this uh, perpendicular here. So what we're saying is that E over 2 divided by R is equal to the sine of the angle, which is half of delta. So sine of delta over 2. And now we make use of a bit of mathematical geometry, which says that if you have an isosceles triangle where these two 
sides are distance r and this is et you may notice that that's exactly what we've got here r r and et and you have an external angle which in our case is pi minus sorry pi minus n delta in those circumstances et is equal to et is equal to twice the radius so 2 times r times the cosine of half this angle so it's the cosine of pi minus n delta over 2 that's just a geometrical theorem provided you've got an isosceles triangle the length of the third um, part of the triangle is equal to twice the uh, twice the other the isosceles part of the triangle multiplied by the cosine of half that angle so et is equal to 2r times the cosine of half this angle but we have just shown this relationship here which means that we can write a value for r and r is equal to half e divided by the sine of delta over 2 we got that from this formula here r you take that up there bring the sine delta over 2 down here you get r is equal to e over 2 divided by the sine of delta over 2 so we've got this value for r which we can substitute in here and that gets us a rather um, difficult equation that et is equal to e times the cosine of pi minus n delta over 2 divided by the sine of delta over 2 because the 2 and the half cancel out so when you put r in here you get et is equal to e times the cosine of pi minus n delta over 2 divided by the sine of delta over 2 I can simplify that a little bit further because the sine of sorry the cosine of pi over 2 minus n delta over 2 I'll say that again the cosine of pi over 2 minus n delta over 2 is equal to the sine of n delta over 2 et is equal to e times the sine of n delta over 2 divided by the sine of delta over 2 remember pi over 2 is 180 degrees sorry pi over 2 is 90 degrees and the cosine of 90 degrees minus an angle is equal to the sine of that angle so I've rewritten that formulae and the question I want to ask is what happens when delta goes to zero now we already know what happens because if delta is zero all the waves will be in phase and that is the condition for brightness and so you will get a maximum where the total E field will be capital N where N is the number of slits times the value of the individual E field but what happens if delta is zero in this formula here well if delta is zero you get sine of zero at the top and you get sine of zero at the bottom so you get and the sine of zero of course is zero so you get zero divided by zero and that's indeterminate but some clever mathematician has shown that if you take the sine of nx and divide it by the sine of x then as x tends to zero the value of sine nx divided by the sine of x will become n consequently as the sine of n delta over 2 divided by the sine of delta over 2 as delta tends to 0 the value of the sine divided by sine term will be capital N and consequently when delta is 0 et becomes e times the value of this term as delta tends to 0 which is n and that's exactly what we had found before that the total E field will be n times the value of the single E field 
when delta is zero, all the waves are in phase. And just to remind you that the vectorial uh, addition was trivial for a four slit grating, we just line them all up and we say that the total E field is four times the individual E field. And remember that at maximum, the intensity is proportional to the value of the E field squared, which means that's going to be proportional to N squared E squared, the square of the number of slits times the square of the actual E field itself. So if N is four, the intensity is going to be 16 times the brightness of the individual field, or more accurately, 16 times the brightness that you would get from a single slit. Now let's just consider the condition for brightness. Once again, I'm going to take just a four slit diffraction grating to keep it simple. We're looking at an angle theta. And if that is the condition for maximum, in other words, all those waves are going to be in phase, then we've already shown that n lambda is equal to d sine theta, where d is the distance between any two adjacent slits. That means that n lambda over d is equal to sine theta. And now we can plot a graph. And the graph is going to show intensity, or if you prefer the E field, it doesn't matter which one you do, against the value of sine theta. We know that there will be a bright spot when sine theta equals zero. In other words, um, opposite the slit, there will be a bright spot. What this tells you is that there will be a bright spot for every value or every whole number value of lambda over d. So there'll be a bright spot at lambda over d, and there'll be another bright spot at 2 lambda over d, and so on. And there'll even be a bright spot at minus lambda over d, because the fringes are on either side of the central major fringe. Incidentally, I've drawn these as if the brightnesses will all be the same. They won't, but um, uh, I'm just doing this for illustrative purposes. Um, as you get further away from the central fringe or the central bright spot, you find that the intensity starts to fall off. Now, I am going to assert at this point, and then I'm going to show it, that for a four slit uh, grating, there will be three positions of minima between each of the maxima. So for each of um, the maxima, there will be three areas between the two where there will be no light at all. Or more generally, if you've got n slits, then there will be n minus one minima sorry, n minus one minima between each of the maxima. If there are four, that means there'll be three minima. If there are 13,000 slits, it means there'll be 12,999 minima. Now, how did I know that there would be n minus one minima between any two adjacent maxima or constructive interference fringes? Well, I've rewritten the formula that we derived before which shows the value of the E field for any value of delta, that is the phase angle between any two successive um, waves. If you're gonna have a minima darkness, that means ET must be zero. In order for e C, uh, ET to be zero, sine N delta over two must be zero because obviously the value of each individual E field won't be zero, so sine n delta over two must equal zero in order to get a minimum. But sine delta over two must not be zero because when that's zero, that's a condition for maximum. So in other words, sine, the only way you can get that is if sine n delta over two is equal to some whole number of pi. In those circumstances, then the numerator will be zero, but the denominator will not necessarily be zero.
oops, that's a mistake. That sign term should not be there, of course. What I'm actually saying is n delta over 2 must equal n pi, because then the sine of n delta over 2 is equal to the sine of n pi, and the sine of n pi is 0. Thank goodness I spotted that before um, I put it up, otherwise that would have needed an annotation. So if we rearrange this formula, we get that delta is equal to n times 2 times pi divided by capital N. That just brings the 2 up here, brings the n down here, and you get that delta is equal to 2 pi n divided by capital N. But we also showed earlier in this video that delta is equal to 2 pi times d, which is the uh, distance between two adjacent slits, times the sine of theta, all divided by lambda. And so we can equate the two. This is the condition, remember, for minima. This is the condition that will derive a zero term at the top here, so that et is zero. And this is a general term. So if we equate the two, we get that 2 pi n over n, which is this term here, is equal to 2 pi d sine theta over lambda. Obviously, the two pi's cancel out, and you end up with sine theta is equal to small n lambda divided by capital N d. And that is the condition for a minima, destructive interference, darkness. So let's redraw our diagram where we were showing the intensity, or if you like, the total E field against sine theta. And here is the midpoint fringe, which is at sine theta equals zero. And here is the first fringe, which is at lambda over d. We showed that just a moment ago. Now let us suppose in this formula here, which remember is the formula for darkness, that n equals one. Then sine theta, so n equals one, means that sine theta is equal to lambda over nd. And let's use my example of n equals four. It's a four slit grating. That means that that is one quarter of lambda over d. This whole distance here is lambda over d. So this will be one quarter of lambda over d, and that's our first minimum. What happens when n equals two in this formula here? Well, in those circumstances, sine theta will equal two lambda over nd. And once again, if capital N is four, that will be one half of lambda over d. So there will be a second minimum at half lambda over d. What happens if N is three? Then sine theta will equal three lambda over capital ND. And again, if N is four, that's three quarters of lambda over d. And so you are gonna get a third minimum at that point, three quarters of the way. And when n equals four, sine theta is equal to four lambda over nd. And when capital N is four, that of course is lambda over d. But lambda over d is the condition for the brightness. And so there were three minima with a little bit of light between them, not much, between every two maxima. And more generally, you can use this formula to show that whatever value of capital N you choose, there will always be N minus one minima between the two maxima. Now, I still haven't really answered the question, why is uh, 13,000 lines on a diffraction grating any better than a double slit? Well, here's the reason. What is the width of this fringe here? If the grating is a, a four slit grating? Well, very roughly, we know that this distance, 
from fringe to fringe is lambda over 2. So the width of one fringe, given that there are three uh, minima, the width of one fringe is about a quarter of lambda over d. Or, more generally, if you have n slits, the width will be 1 over n, lambda over d. And now you can see the benefit of the diffraction grating. It's all to do with resolution. If we take, pull this down. If we take a double slit, then there's a maximum. There will only be one minimum because for a double slit, n minus one minima means there's only one minimum between the two. And there is the next maxima. And the width of those maxima will be very wide. In other words, you won't be able to precisely identify where those maxima might fall. On the other hand, if you've got 13,000 slits, as you would in a, in a diffraction grating, then you will get a maxima, then you'll get 12,999 minima before you get the next maxima. And those maxima are going to be very, very thin indeed. They can't other, be otherwise because you've got to fit in 12,999 minima between them. So the resolution, the ability to define precisely where that brightness falls, is absolute, far better than here. So the more lines you have, the greater the spectral resolution, the better you're able to define precisely where this fringe occurs. And as you will see from this formula here, as n increases, so the width of the uh, fringe decreases, and that's what makes it a better resolution. You can precisely see where it is.